A specter is haunting the internet. An image, a persona, a mask, the very image that haunts the autiste, the hyper online, and fills men and boys with dread, with longing, with a need, a yearning for redemption. I am of course talking about the e-girl who haunts the digital space. The e-girl, as we know, is a rhizomatic being. She can take on any form, take on any fancy, become anything that you like. Together, me and my friend Kruner, a documentarian with unique skills in documenting the history, the development, and the archetypal meaning of the e-girl. Together, we shall show on a deeper level that the e-girl is a vital force in the modern world. Because the muse to creative geniuses are as old as time itself. Our age is no different because in order to achieve the heights of supreme content, the muse must reappear in history in our timeline. This is where the e-girl comes in. Crooner will explain the significances that the e-girl adapts whether it be the mother figure, the maternal, that which all life springs forth from. Consciousness itself achieves awareness from its origination in the mother. The e-girl can take place of the mother, but as Croner explains, also the sacred prosty. The e-girl is a force that compels men in the internet age. We shall go over such topics as the detachment of the e-girl from her persona, her persona becoming an ergogor, a force that compels the woman behind the e-girl into various behaviors and to play a character, if you will. We shall talk about how the internet itself transforms the identity of the e-girl, how true romance and love can be achieved through LARPing, and how LARPing can become a source of, in, of authenticity away from inauthenticity. The role of the feminine, the anima in the digital age. Crooner, like no other, explains these things. This podcast will be an in-depth explanation of the very essence of the e-girl. And how the e-girl can become a source of vital transformation. Content lives on underneath the specter of the muse. I've never watched your uh, show before or like break the rules. Oh shit. Oh snap. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I got to check that out. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> so you don't know the deep lore. So maybe it's good to go at it with um, pure eyes, but uh, okay. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> But I, like, uh, yeah, yeah, what? The one I watched, I actually, I did see one. I think Zero HP Lovecraft was on, and maybe the train guy. Uh oh, oh, and uh, Ostov, and I think you guys were talking about Cyberpunk. That's the one oh, I saw. Oh yeah, that that had Barrett on too, if I recall. Um, I want to get him on on my show too, uh, because like I feel like as BTR, well, like I mean, getting like more like smaller people from Twitter or people that have you know, an insight into things like that sort of, um, as, as you grow as a platform, then it becomes like, Oh, let's get on a big account. It's like, that's kind of, to me, I don't really, I mean, it's nice having big accounts, but I like people that yeah. are doing creative and interesting things, even though they don't have like quote unquote, that's big awesome. numbers, you know, but, um, I that's why I wanted to, that. yeah. Like that's why I wanted to reach, reach out to you because I feel like, um, thank you what you're doing with the e-girl documentary uh, is uh, I think I, I followed you before I knew about you before on Twitter, but um, what you're doing with the e-girl documentary, I think is fascinating. I think that you managed to tap into something. Thank you. And um, like, I, I obviously like right off the bat, people would compare it to like, um, you know, meme analysis and meme analysis. He's right. been good to me, but um, I feel like what you're doing is, sort of specific in that you're crafting a narrative 
And you tend to, I think, get at the nuance of it a bit more. But anyways, without me like babbling, uh, maybe just give a quick introduction to you and your work and what you're doing. And uh, yeah, what it, what is taking the crooner pill? Um, okay, so two years ago, I just had these insane insights when uh when started in like the first month or two of lockdown i had actually been um trying to e-date and like I, oh I, there's a yo, yeah and there was like a couple like uh girls who i noticed what happened was they would 100 percent be performing with me like when they would like talk to me they were larping like uh i love lucy episode like through text message <laughs> like honey i'm home <laughs> yeah and then i it was fun and we were playing the game and then as soon as i started to get um genuine it's like it was like i was like an actor who broke the fourth wall and they mm. were like dude that's not cool and like ghosted me and then i was trying to think about like the the performative nature of whether it's relationships or especially an online relationship because it's a lot of just like instances of yourself wearing a mask or something and so i i pretty much wrote a book uh it wasn't like really edited and um then i got into an actual <laughs> e-relationship oh, wow. uh after i yeah after i wrote that book and um that got like pretty real and like but then that ended poorly and i was wandering like uh, like a sad man for a few months and then i i had this like second wind when this springtime came around to go back to this book with the new things i've learned um and this book is like i said it's like the e-girl documentary is what this original text was it's like a bunch of different essays now i've turned it into and um they describe the e-girl like the experience in general of being online i like to call it existentialism as like uh <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I, it's also i think in the realm of virtual gender studies is a funny way to put it um it's about how we perform gender online because it's absolutely performed i mean oh yes. you could be like just raw online but there is a game that's played and so it's analyzing this it's analyzing the e-girl as the crisis actor and using a lot of like mythology to help flesh that out that's that's really great. I think that um, the performativity aspect of it, I mean, the the problem I feel is that um, a lot of like terrible readers of um, various postmodern works, uh, like my mission online, I think, has been to, I mean, maybe de by de facto is to bring people an awareness of these texts. For example, when people hear performativity, they think immediately of like Judith Butler, Gender Troubles. Um, but performativity in gender is very real, and especially with the sort of nature of the online, something that uh, mm -hmm. you're getting at, I feel, is very important to study e-gender <laughs> e studies. Yeah. It's amazing, yeah. I think it's cool. And one thing that's like, I think it's a, I, there's this word people throw around, hyper real. Mm -hmm. I think it's like a, a caricature, maybe, of like the actual gender games we play. And th this is this is what I'm kind of fleshing out about, uh, like the save her role. Like we're really or the succubus, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's like e girls will directly dress as the succubus. Belle Delphine does this, and like be like, I'm the succubus, and I'm here to stab you of your frill. <laughs> and boys are like, boys are like, yes. And it's like you know we don't say that in real normal normie life to each other, but we're doing it. Right. Um, and on online, we're like, whether like consciously aware, we're like really just outwardly manifesting the games we play. I'm gonna save her. Oh, I'm Rapunzel locked in her tower. Oh, I'm the succubus. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so yeah, it's analyzing this. Can you um name this uh, particular? The, like, see, my mind goes right to the Fusilli painting of the succubus, but it's a it's sorry the incubus, but it's like this weird form where. I had a idea for painting like that once. I think it was called My Angel. I wanted. I did a few mono prints, but they didn't come out the way I wanted. Where it's like the man is like lying before a computer screen, and he sees an angelic woman on top of him, 
Nice. I mean, even Edvard Munch had a, he was no computer screen, but there was a picture where he had these like angelic women on his mind because to me, Edvard Munch is like the OG, like incel artist in that he, right. <laughs> he switched from violent uh, fantasies of, you know, to keep a YouTube friendly uh, RPing and dominance. But then he was yeah. in his work. He was also powerless among like literal vampire women. So that's like that weird dichotomy. Yeah. Uh, but can you, um, well, comment on that. And then also, um, do you, can you name this particular, uh, e-girl that you were dating or you would rather not? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to. Is she online? <laughs> like, is she, um, a poster or? Yeah. 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 She's okay. like 2,500 followers or something like this. Oh, well, wait, which one? Because look, I've dated a few and there's like, um, that, that was the long-term relationship that this isn't the one who I'm talking about the performative Oh, okay. aspect with yeah that was like a that was a small follower like uh <laughs> like 200 follower e-girl who was followed by like all the big accounts like and oh so, you know, very she, very weird how there's some of them that are... i think they they work their way up hierarchy it's one of those things you know where like they yeah do, do you feel that um is there a there's so many things to talk about and I think we'll probably be here for three or four hours, hopefully, but, or maybe you can, uh, we could do it in the different parts, but, um, do you feel that there, well, okay. Coming on the Edvard Monk thing, I'm getting ahead of myself. Do, do you feel that the second part of your documentary about the hero, do you feel that there is a level of psychic powerlessness and that the e-girl is, um, the, the sort of the agent having agency or do you feel that there is a level of agency among the simp or the incel or the yeah. pay pay goo? Or do you feel that they're um, just a helpless, hapless wit victim? Yeah. This is a good question. It depends on what they do with their volcellism. So if they are, if they take the, let's say, monk pledge of like being a volcell, if they are able to basically ignore like the the feminine energy or whatever and go, I call it like Napoleon mindset, like to other <laughs> projects yeah. or like Odysseus on the ship. Then like they absolutely have an agency there and a power. But if you're like me, what happens is all like pledge Volsal. But then at the same time, I'm 100% subject to the direction of the feminine muses. And despite being Volsal, like 100% of my energy goes to philosophizing about women <laughs> or like about <laughs> Belle Delphine. Is that any better than actually like giving up the frill in the first place? Right, right. And you used the uh, William Waterhouse painting in one scene, which um, I'm not a, like my my one of my best friends, Matthew the Stout, he's a huge fan of the pre-Raphaelites. I'm no... I, I'm uh, mixed on it, but I do appreciate Waterhouse's sort of attention to sensuousness, the way that the nymphs are pulling um, oh, pulling yeah. the Peter Pan figure down. I, I forget which uh, Greek. Um, Eilis. Eilis, yes. Yeah, yeah. And you related that to Peter Pan, how the virtual yeah. women, they despise the actual real um, yeah. full woman of, um, oh, what was her name? She slips my mind now um, in Peter Pan. Oh, Wendy. Wendy, yeah, they hate her, but that's that's so fascinating because I feel that it's a it's a weird invasion of the real into the kayfabe, if you will, of the e girl. Yeah, and it, it's be, it's because it's, so the e girl needs attention to stay alive, just like Tinkerbell. And what Wendy does, I mean, Tinkerbell hates her. If you watch the film, Tinkerbell like will literally tug Wendy's hair away mm. um, because Tinkerbell, who's the e girl like literally in the movie requires attention or she fades away she dies and the e-girl or rather her avatar online you know the things she creates is just like this where it requires attention and um you know they they like to keep simps or whoever in orbit i think the male gaze feeds that energy and that's where the succubus idea comes in mm -hmm. and the real girl or the Napoleon mindset, either one of these, you know, detracts attention away from Tinkerbell and she dies and she doesn't want that. It's a survival instinct. And so whatever gets attention, whether it's being a whore or it's like damsel posting, whatever it is. <laughs> damsel posting. Um, it, again, it's very much like Edvard Monk where uh, I always use this line because uh, he's like my favorite art critic, uh, Robert Hughes. 
said that Manka, you know, the only option men have is to submit to the marriage bed and be in face castration. Sex is, uh, you know, what do you say? Sex is ominous and hateful. A man can only be castrated or become an incel and then like face total humiliation <laughs> so, in Monk's worldview. But it's it's almost yeah. true because now the, the e-girl can't, um, the e-girl cannot deliver, I think, a, a proper like satisfaction of the libido apart from onanism. But why well, I, is this? I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I agree with that. I also wanted to say that Paul from the Bible, also like in the literal Paul from the Bible yes. and like Corinthians, he has this line too where he's like, regarding taking a wife, I recommend all men stay like me, which is false. And only if you have to, like if you can't resist temptation, he doesn't say castrate yourself, but he says then take a wife. Yeah, there's some there's something deeper there, I think. I mean, that's why Young, I think, wins out over the Freudian um the libidinal the libidinal economy of the subject is kind of restricting. I think that the e girl possesses almost like as as weird as this sounds a spiritual force, not for the good. Absolutely. Thing. Well, so the one justifying <laughs> I have two justifications for the e girl that are for the good. So while there is a succubus energy to it, she does do two things. One, she can cause the boy to become the hero. In the sense that they might want to perform for her and shape themselves up a little bit, you know, like become the kind of guy out of the underworld or whatever it is who could save her and improve himself. So he uses <laughs> her, who's like a fictional character, as like a more like a diving board or something to for self improvement. And then there's also, which I don't completely understand yet, the e girl as the mother, which is a healing archetype. That's mm -hmm. the fairy godmother thing, and the way we go into bath water and sensory deprivation tanks and stuff. They can do something redemptive as the mother or at least as like the damsel who calls the boy to shape up as the hero. So I'm not completely anti e-girl performance, but it can go very bad. Oh, I think we should erect a gallows for. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you're right. Um, And, and the way that uh, I think like when you watch the e-girl documentary, you can see these um, online motifs spliced with your tweets spliced with other references like for example um well to to like mommy lana lana del rey is obviously Love it. the big like uh you <laughs> know for both fem cells and incels she is like the mother yeah um there's that Seriously. one yeah for, i wanted to ask you about lana but before we get ahead of ourselves um Another hilarious thing is the the one scene in the pool where Bap uh, Bap's old avatar is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I me and my best friend in real life we were watching together, and I, I just lost it at that. Like that was. I'm like, glad Bap. to hear. <laughs> but it's thank funny. you. Oh man, like it's funny because this um, best friend I have in real life, we um, he is actually what I would consider a Volcel because he had um, yeah. a disastrous relationship where this Vietnamese woman basically almost tried to destroy his, you know, being. And yeah. she could only feel emotions through sexuality, more or less. So the sex was amazing, but like, um, it destroyed him. And then he, you know, currently yeah. he has had numerous offers from women. He's not like, you know, a giga chat or whatever. Like he's kind of a goofy looking guy, but he's had female attention, but he chooses not to. And I go, Josh, right. why? like, why do you do this to yourself? He goes, well, cause you know, uh, there's a part of you he's like there's a part of you that can um he said this to me once there's a part of you you can't get back in some ways so this reminds me of the vagina dentata myth that you lose something inside the woman you know the yes. teeth yes exactly and so there's this there is this motif and it's ancient of um well yeah like a castration inside the woman is a risk but there is an answer to this castration, which I think is, I, I call it equipping a sword. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's replacing with like some other phallic symbol. So if you lose like the, like the sexual, like phallic symbol in um, like castration, let's say you get like destroyed by a woman, right? And you lose that. Well, you can take up a sword then, and that might be like having some great adventure to sort of reinvigorate yourself and kind of reclaim the phallic symbol that you lost in some sense. So maybe as Volcel, whatever he lost, he can 
like uh, reintegrate through some big quest or something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think like that's why when people say like especially women online they do like the penis envy thing or not one well, of the penis envy thing the, the um you're compensating for something but i feel that the phallic symbol is a powerful force upon it is the most powerful force upon the male psyche for a reason i feel that seriously yeah can i tell a quick anecdote yeah you go ahead go ahead um one time i was i was playing frisbee in washington dc right under the monument oh god and <laughs> i broke my ankle and I had to wait for the frisbee game to be done. And so I laid there for maybe 35 minutes. Oh, brutal. Right right under the Washington Monument, which is the, you know, the phallic Osiris symbol, just staring up at it. And if you've ever seen it, it has glowing red eyes. So the whatever psycho experience of like being in writhing pain with like broken bones underneath a giant obelisk, like staring up at it, staring down at you, like from, you know, it's like... <laughs> Don't, uh, I don't know how to unpack it, but that was something there regarding phallic symbols. One of my really interesting. One of my favorite, um, well, my favorite band, Nevermore, uh, rest in peace, World Dane. Uh, they have one. They're one of their their last albums. They did was Obsidian Conspiracy. In the album cover, there are these two, um, like polar, like polar opposite yin and yang beings, and right in between them is like this post apocalyptic scene, and there is the Washington uh, obelisk there. Um, and nice. Yeah, it's really it's really metal, but uh, I think that the obelisk is such a powerful symbol throughout. It's it's a mono symbol. It's a meta pattern, I think. Um, and yeah, the, in Washington, I guess we live in a strange time where the sort of fabulation of American life and Hollywood and the online world, which is largely Americanized, uh, I think is in some ways trying to rep repress this phallic energy, but you know, like the yeah. log house thing, but in other ways it is yeah. kind of like a, a weird inversion of it. But, um, but before we get ahead of ourselves, what do you think you, you mentioned that the E girl is an essential girl. So maybe take us through, right. um, the E cause someone yeah. asked me today on Twitter, they're like, what does E mean? I go, well, it becomes, comes from internet explorer. Like what is the etymology of that? Like it comes from internet explorer, but then E becomes this like symbol or right. suffix for online. Like I have this series I'm writing uh, about the E right, for instance. Like if you're like, what is the E right? Like what does that mean? You know. Right. So take us through what you mean by E and what you mean by essential girl. What I essentially mean by E uh, as the girl being the essential girl is that the E girl is the actor who is able upon being gazed instantiate an archetypal female role Man. and it's this archetypal female role whether it's the succubus or it's the mother or it's the holy prostitute right something damsel in distress that's a classic like female mode of being it's like a game she can play that's the an essential role for mm -hmm. the female mm -hmm. The e-girl is the type of actress who's able to instantiate this well and demonstrate it for us. And this happens when she's gazed upon. And this is why I call Lana an e-girl. Like, is, is she really online? Not, not in the way, you know? And nor is every girl on the internet an e-girl. No. Right. It, it's these girls. Yeah. It's these girls who can play these roles, knowingly or not, and demonstrate it to us and give us a chance to play with the role like i was saying when i was like dating that e-girl and like i noticed it was all larp like she would text me and it was like we were on stage she was like playing honey i'm home and so she was demonstrating a role the trad wife e-girl is a role <laughs> um lana i think plays mommy usually but she can switch to lolita and stuff which is a kind of save me daddy sort of thing you yes, know yes yes which is in a way like a complication of um the various female archetypes and, and rather yeah. the, the sort of like the tripartite stage of the, you know, maiden mother crone. If you can revert back to the maiden, back to the Lolita character, then it's almost like, I think why like the teen mother is such a powerful uh, archetype yeah. in his, in, in recent like media and history, like teen moms or whatever, because essentially a child becomes the progenitor of a child. I mean, but I guess yeah. we only think of it that way because, of course, people had children a lot quicker. Not to just Mother Mary. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Um, by the way, crooner, the word crooner comes from the same word as crone. <laughs> yeah, um, there you which go. Is, yeah. Which is a murmuring of pain. So that's what crooner is. <laughs> <laughs> not to justify, not to make some crazy weird argument that, I don't know, we should lower the age of consent because it's natural. Like that's pure, like... That's like internet wet brain, in my opinion. A lot of things are natural. Return to tradition. <laughs> but it's funny. Do you feel that um, the the sort of revival of the cottage core trad waifu? Do you feel that a woman could potentially LARP it till she makes it? Like absolutely, is she, she can LARP absolutely. to the point where she has five children and lives on a homestead. Like I don't know. One hundred percent. So it, it, I haven't made any videos about this, but in the book, towards the end. Um, there's a whole section about those method actors who become their characters. Mm -hmm. you, you've heard this kind of thing? And yeah, so Daniel De Lewis, do... he would act like a psycho. and <laughs> yeah. So she would be better to talk about it, but you know Soph, the e-girl Soph? Oh, yes. So she was talking to me about how she would she was kind of LARPing as this damsel in distress who needed to be saved, sort of as a character, but then... Like, it got real because somebody actually came along and, like, saved her, so to speak. I, I, th I think she got married. She says this. And so there, there is a way that LARPing is a means of becoming. And, uh, by the way, I... What Sophie are you referring to? So I think her at right now is, like, a live girl 011. Oh, her, this... She, sorry. Yeah, because I thought... I'm like, how can Soph get married? She's only like 15 years old. I thought you meant the, the Soph. No. Um, the, yeah, yeah, not the Soph. The one who was 17? Oh, yeah, that the, one. Not not Soph like as LT Corbis, the one that, you know. I don't know her. Oh, no, yeah, she was a um, 15-year-old girl that uh, did these videos, and now she's on Gavin McGinnis's uh, network after being taken off of YouTube. Um, <laughs> you mean, you mean on, yeah, on Twitter. I think I know who you're referring to, yes. So she yeah, well, actually LARPed into, into a marriage. Um, yeah. Oh, my and God. Absolutely. Yeah. LARPing is a means of becoming. It's like method acting. And so the the boy, if he's willing to kind of play the part with the damsel in distress e-girl, he can kind of become a heroic person himself. Get his act together. And yeah, the girl can absolutely become a real trad wife. It's not bad for them to, to LARP. <laughs> well, I think that it's better than they LARP that than the various other LARPs that the modern world gives young women nowadays. I mean, that goes without saying, but then there's, there is a question of it being inauthentic or, or just a fad, but then everything. Well, is a fad. the moon just reflects the light of the sun. How authentic <laughs> is that? There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, so the essential girl fulfills this role. So, but the counter argument just to play devil's advocate would be that does it mean, sorry, does it mean by necessity that uh, the male gaze gives a sort of authenticity to the role of the feminine and that can women achieve agency or rather <laughs> authenticity? His agency is a very screwy word. But let's say authenticity outside of right. the role of the male gaze. Uh, so what they what they are is their own kind of like authenticity in the first place, which I call being becoming. Mm -hmm. And that's I talk about the thing that can become butterfly or the girl. Right. And uh, is she dreaming she's a butterfly or is she dreaming she's a girl? She's a thing that could be both. And it's kind of like ditto from Pokemon. I feel like that's like the authentic. <laughs> uh, and and that, that in itself is totally genuine. It is what it is. And it's, but it's the male gaze that causes them to shape up into something and they take on a form, and then if they act it out enough, they can kind of really instantiate that form and become it. That's that's fascinating because I, I remember um a few nights ago when I was uh when I was watching it with my best friend, I paused at that moment where you said this piece was from a Dolce and Gabbana Somerset. Like oh, the Abercrombie and Fitch magazine. Abercrombie and French magazine, yeah. yeah. Somerset back to school. And yeah. I paused it. I was going insane because yeah. um, <laughs> I said to I said to Josh, I said, "This is if you were to like give this text to a theory cell, and they wouldn't know better. They would assume it's from Deleuze and Guattari. It's from A Thousand Plateaus. It's from specifically that essays on becoming. And I feel 
like exactly like Deleuze says um exactly almost that that women are primarily as a minoritarian force not a because the, the face of the man is majoritarian but as a min minoritarian force the woman is a being of pure becoming but Absolutely. it's it, but it's not like um it's not like you become another form it's rather the becoming itself it's the capacity to be a butterfly that the male yeah. gaze sees within the woman and so that passage is an incredible like that was i i don't know how you came like how you came across that one that was nice go, yeah so, go you, you explain explain uh, to the audience yeah so uh, on the abercrombie fitch thing shout out to like some old like 2017 there was like abercrombie and fitch hollister twitter there's like my friend tanner <laughs> crombie and we were we were a thing it was like hollister nationalism or something oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up like buying these old catalogs like for aesthetics and like discovering the wealth there's like a q a in the back by like the writer or like you know the editor who's like yeah i have slaves that lather me in coconut oil while i edit this magazine <laughs> it's from like 2003. um but uh, so disclosure that that those quotes are actually written by zizek for the magazine oh so, okay that explains yeah. it that explains yeah. it there you <laughs> they they commissioned him to like caption photos so, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> But it's funny that where well, they are in context, you think of who read it. It was like, you know, like 19 year old Michelle in 2003 at the beach or something. Like, yeah. Li li <laughs> <laughs> listening to My Chemical Romance. Well, or, well, no, no, listening to um, Dashboard Confessional or whatever in the sun, on the beach reading that. Yeah. And, um, and what you were saying about um, like girls being becoming. Um, yeah. And this is, I think, why there is the uh, association with the moon being feminine and like girls are always associated with the moon in some sense yeah i think it is i mean that's what it does it one it orbits things it reflects the light of the sun but it does have its own kind of gravity too yeah it has its own gravity but also it's it's subtle effect upon other things that are coded as feminine. oceans oceans yes but also like i believe periods as well that's like another oh yeah yeah that's fascinating oh yeah it's true um that's why I think they, they say that the wolf mythology, the lichen mythology, um, has yeah. also some kind of feminine connotation there as well, because um, I was thinking of this last night. Yeah, like the wolf mother thing is. Um, well, I don't hmm, I don't know wolf mother, but I was thinking about Sigma male and I was like, that's like a pretty masculine vol cell ideology. But I was like, yet yeah, they like worship the moon like the Sigma wolf does and how's the moon. <laughs> So I was like, is this, is this what I do is Valsell writing about Belle Delphine? That's me as the Sigma wolf howling at the moon. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like, um, the old, uh, he ran Jacob, Jacobite magazine, Robert Mariani. He came up with this term called, uh, the M to M, the male to male trans about like, you know, man of sphere wow. grifters and like masculinity coaches and Sigma grind set coaches and shit. Um, That's awesome. I think it's true though, because it's sort of like, you're kind of like an AGP, you're like performing this weird fetishistic LARP, but it's the male escaping into a fantasized version of the male. But do you think that the e-girl escapes into the fantasized version of the feminine? Like, are they these supremely calculating sort of Machiavellian no. figures or no. is it just natural? It's just, it's, they're just going with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> they're vibing they're vibing and so okay yeah so here we go here we go um regarding vibing and this reflecting back to us what they do is the e-girl goes online without much intention right right but the girls are really sensitive to vibes right they can pick up on whatever's happening on the timeline even without fully understanding it and be able to reflect back to us what we want to see like i don't think too many e-girls came online intending to larp trad life but they went on and kind of felt around intuitively and maybe without putting it in words like knew like oh they want to see the trad wife and like, boom. <laughs> do you, sorry but, <clears throat> yeah <clears throat> but uh, do you feel that this like the the e-girl itself is like a, a uh, how shall I say it is a, is sort of like a polyvocal entity. There's a variety of forces or. Is okay. There... Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm going to get crazier with this one. 
a theory that might not be true and i kind of have fun with it is that the av okay the avatar she creates online is becomes a kind of egregore or like tulpa type thing mm-hmm. that wants the sustaining of its own existence so it influences the e-girl to perform like a little puppet master pulling oh, strings wow. Wow. to to keep it alive so it's like it's not Belle Delphine being the succubus, but there's some entity that's been created online in a sense, a kind of egregore or tulpa that is like influencing Belle Delphine to dress up as the succubus and command some of the attention to keep this online entity like Tinkerbell alive through attention. That thing's going to be around after Belle Delphine's rotting in the dirt. <laughs> Riding in the back of the trunk. Oh no, sorry, sir. No, epic, dude. Epic. <laughs> One time, this guy showed up at my house at 5 a.m. and attacked me and started yelling that I was hiding his wife's body in my trunk. What? What? No disclosure. Yeah, for real. And he chased me around the neighborhood and then he just left. It was so weird. Oh my god. <laughs> was he a meth uh, zombie or something? No, he was so clean cut. I think he was schizo. Oh, but, uh, okay. There you go. There you go. But it's, that's traditional. You know, like the Norse word, or not Norse, uh, like Indo European, I think, word for wedding, like was compl- it was a verb. Wedding, I think, was a verb referring to the kidnapping of brides. <laughs> <laughs> Return to tradition. Man. Return to tra- <laughs> the bridal sack. Yeah. And going further, the whole. <clears throat> Obviously, it's like in old, maybe it's not instinct, but old, 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 like tradition that you it was kidnapping of brides for wedding. And I think the the way that we save pictures of girls on our phone is our own little capturing process. Oh, very much so. I mean, I, full disclosure, um, I I've done this where I have like you know a whole library of photos of just women. I mean, mostly for drawing references, but also there's something about the the visage of certain women do you remember on 4chan the uh you love you lose threats do you remember those uh not specifically it was like the sort of like you you post photos of like usually like pixie girls you know like that type of facial feature and it was like you love you lose meaning like you know you you uh fall in love with the image of woman and it's like oh yeah i think our name k started off so you know say no more but it seems there's that... An... Yeah, go ahead. There's another Greek myth, Pygmalion or something, mm-hmm. who, like, sculpts a woman, like, a fake woman. I don't remember it exactly, and, like, falls in love with it. Yeah, that's where Pygmalionism as, like, a uh, paraphilia comes from. It oh, comes from nice. That, yeah, it comes from that <laughs> myth. Like, I remember you even tweeted out the the saying about, um, I... I I saw her in the marble. I had to carve her out like something like that. Um, and uh, it, it, I remember it was part of the documentary, but uh, it's, yeah, but do you feel like the, what I mean is like, do you feel the e-girl spans influences? Like, it seems that mm-hmm. there, there is, um, it seems she like, has the, orbiters. yeah, the, she has orbiters, but like these orbiters, like, it seems that it's not just a like phenomenon of a particular group. Because there's like leftist e girls, there's like the Twitch streamer socialists, yeah. then there's like right wing equivalent, which is I guess is like the there's guy no right wing or there's no right wing woman. No, there is no true right wing woman. That is true. I mean that. <laughs> yeah, there's no such so, thing. But <laughs> but why is that though? People have said that. Why is the? Do you mean that? Well, yeah. This gets back to the question of how authentic can the LARP be? Oh, true, true. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 I was going to ask you, like, why is there, um, why is there, like, no authentic right-wing woman? Is it just that their inherent instincts are repelled by, like, extreme far-right ideology? Or Okay, I, t- I tend to think it's just, like, uh, it's like when they go online, they kind of sense the vibes, they pick up what we're throwing down, like, the need for trad wife, and maybe without even articulating it, they're able to like shape up as the trad wife and give it to us. I think it's just like a similar thing. Like they're able to go out, sense the vibes and be like, oh, they want based right wing girl and be able to just like present it for us. It's like playing dress up a little bit. I don't know. I feel like a lot of um, e-girls among the right wing that aren't like 
fem like they're in like rad femmes. Like that's well, I'll I'll ask you about that later. But it seems that the e girls that like <laughs> orbit the right wing. <laughs> I hate to say it. I mean, I'm friends with a lot of them. They're they're kind of like neuroatypical in some ways. They're kind of like oh, there's like autistic girls. Yeah, they're autistic, but also they have like some personality disorder because I feel like a woman that like LARPs far right ideology is kind of disturbing in some ways. I don't know. It's, I mean, you, yeah. yeah. I haven't given this one too much thought. It's interesting. Well, I, the, the, the leftist e-girl I think is performing a different role in that like, she is sexually, mommy. yeah. She's mommy to them when they don't have mommy in terms of a natalism. Like I, I said this with Alex Kashuda, actually. Not that she's an e-girl, but I said that you know how um, Liz Bruneg posts like photos of her breastfeeding because she knows right. that her audience is like these leftoids, these irony cells that don't have like a strong like natalist instinct. In fact, they have quite an anti-natalist instinct. But the leftist e-girl is like mommy, but also like 90s cool girl, sexually available type of LARP. I mean, I th- so yeah. yeah, there was um, Ishtar, like the uh, Sumerian goddess who was mommy and like provider of like, you know, milk and breast to the world and also the goddess of prostitution and whoredom. And like her temples were also uh, like, you know, layers of prostitution yeah. and such. And she was mommy. So there is like an instinct to conflate these two. And that might be the Oedipus thing in a sense, but it's a provider, right? If you think of like, you know, sexual like provision in that sense, then it's like, what's the difference between like receiving service and getting milk? It's like both like something in service of. Yeah, there's the goddess whore complex that people, the fem cells in academia lament, but it is true. I mean, there is some, I think like, as controversial as it is, the perfect woman for a lot of men is basically a mommy that they can have sex with. Like that is the id brain male impulse is like, I want mommy in more ways than one, not their actual mothers, but like the mother figure that can nourish and give life to them. But yeah, that's an impulse for sure. But I feel like in some ways that's that hobbles the male. It's kind of like Peter Pan. It enables, exactly. it enables the male. Yeah. So part of my philosophy is is two things. It's like weaning, the process of weaning, which you need to do. And what I always say is coming up out of the water. So like that's the problem with Hylas is he goes down into the water and that's like, you know, get, being healed by the divine feminine, but he never comes back up. So it's this process of coming up. I have all the shots of like Wolverine busting yeah. out of the bathtub. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need mommy's milk and it's like Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But uh, no, it's true. I f- it's a very powerful force. And I feel, do you feel like that's why um, we mentioned the, like with Lana, there is the conflation of the mother yeah. and the Lolita, the the maiden. But do you feel that in modern culture, it could, I mean, it could just be a psyop by like bitter, embittered older women. But do you feel that nowadays there is a particular force with like the mommy GF, MILF porn, um, like the sort of older women, the crone now becomes a symbol of attraction. Or do you feel like that's overstated and like men overwhelmingly still want like younger women? Mm, I, it's, I mean, it's real. Like it absolutely happens. Like guys really do want mommy girlfriend. Like, you know, there's time to time when I'm like, like sad or scared. And like what I don't want at that moment is like, to be the big hero and like you know <laughs> protect baby no it's like i absolutely want just like some kind of like feminine shoulder to cry on you know bap was talking about he knows some guy who hired prostitutes not to have sex with them but so he could just cry on their breast for like an hour yeah this is a big thing this is a big thing yes um so there's something there but it doesn't have to be I think the way the maybe the weaning process is it doesn't have to be your your girlfriend that plays this role. Like people obviously do, and it's coming out that way in society. But like I don't know, there's other things you can do to. I I like to cry to a lot of songs from time to time, and that's like another way of fulfilling this urge. Maybe you can go into like one of those like sensory deprivation water tanks and come out healed, something like this. Um, that that is true, but I I do notice that there is sort of like 
a mainstreaming of it. Um, I just, I posted this image on Twitter so I could, uh, have it in the discord call. But, uh, if you go to my Twitter, let me actually yeah. send it to you. Um, I wanted to give, there was some artist, of course, she's like some, you know, I mean, let's face it, some art hoe or whatever, but like, uh, right. she made this, she does a bunch of these. I forget her name. She slips my mind, but this image, uh, let me share it here. Um, this image of the e-girl, uh, I wanted to talk about because I discovered this like a few years ago. I remember I was at a family reunion. Oh yeah. I was, uh, trying to explain this image to my cousins and like, what's an e-girl? I go, this is, and, and some of them got it, but I'm like, you know, terminal, like schizo online moment. But, uh, the e-girl now is, um, she's, is the e-girl inscribing the role to herself or are they I think, placing it on her or is she participating in that like that is yeah yeah i think it's more of the latter too so i would say it's like this moon analogy so i don't think so much she's like going out there and inscribing it on herself so much as she goes out there picks up on what we're throwing down like kind of what we want to see and she's able to reflect it back to us and perform because but that's the thing though there it's it's complicated there's a dialectic there because she's draw, she's writing it but right. it's more of like they're still they're still requesting that of her that her being is like she has to be nerdy gf she's got to be emo G, emo goth gf you know all right. of them. So I, I, and the artist put lolly gf down there because i feel like the oh, uh, yeah. the the what you point out the neotony thing is um another i was listening to I was just listening to Nightcore playlist yesterday and like so suddenly it was sounding like a baby and I'm like it just is auto playing lolly covers and so <laughs> oh, like, obviously it's like popular. Um what's this dialectic you're talking about? I mean between the seer and, and the scene, between the sort of um the male gaze and the inscription of the male gaze onto the feminine. But yet the feminine also has a weird agency where she inscribes it to herself for her own ulterior motives. So there's kind of like a weird dialectic going on with this image in particular. Um, it's, it's, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure what her ulterior motives are. Well, what is the ulterior motive of the girl? Why does the e girl conform to the masculine gaze? So the one theory I throw down is this Tinkerbell idea where if you don't get attention, you die. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And so then there's also the this kind of a playful one that like the avatar itself kind of is a puppeteer, you know, egregore that makes her dance around and do this to keep it alive. But that this one's a bit fantastic. So if that's not the case... Well, maybe simp bucks is probably another, <laughs> another thing too, but... <laughs> Yeah, but not every girl does it for simp bucks. It's you know? true. It's true. It's true. Maybe, and they LARP different stuff. So if if they're LARPing like damsel in distress, their like ulterior motive might be that they actually do want to be saved, right? Right. And it's like a it's like a process of playing this. But then if they're LARPing mommy girlfriend, I mean, is it like their maternal instinct or I don't? Uh, that is, yeah, that could be part of it, but because the maternal instinct is so repressed nowadays for young women, I feel it comes out in very strange ways. So yeah, that could be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, this is something to explore more. I'm interested in this dialectic idea you're talking about because yeah, my theory is they shape up and reflect back to us kind of what we want to see, but what is she getting out of it? I mean, what, maybe it's just like her natural kind of, process like the the feminine nature is the kind of being becoming like right. being a sort of liquid formlessness and re like requiring the masculine like the moon does the sun to take on form and that's just the game they play that's just like their natural like essence right right i mean e even um even the critique of that uh if you look at more of the like older like existential feminism like de beauvoir for instance in the second sex talks about how the male inscribes a very uh limiting and and uh deleterious picture upon the feminine and the feminine right. has to sort of struggle for authenticity 
um, outside of the male gaze. But I feel like, right. yeah, it's it's a hyper misogynistic idea to say that there is no authenticity outside of the male gaze. But then I don't know throughout human history, I guess even even well, among yeah yeah go ahead go ahead. The authenticity is that being becoming. I think it, I, it's the the ditto shape. I I know I've said this before. Like that is the female essence. I think is this being becoming. It is the the reflecting thing, and then they become one of these roles, whether it's the mother or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But then and that's like the authentic female act, right? But I feel like for some odd reason, a lot of like manosphere discourse is centered around like the vicious critique and even like the bitterness around like. Why do women do this? Why are they hypergamous? Why do they fulfill different roles? Like, why can't they just be like us men and be like logic brain? But I don't feel like to to bitch about like female hypergamy or to bitch about the, the role of like the feminine being a chameleon. I mean, let's face it. Being a chameleon is sort of like a survival instinct for them. But I just. To, well, yeah, not. A, I saw some study one time that chameleons will change their color in nature kind of just for fun and this reminds me of that bap argument where he's like why do they you know like you ever see animals sometimes like do something not just for survival or reproduction like there's a sort of so i saw something that like chameleons sometimes in nature will just like explore their colors mm-hmm. and it's it's possible it's not a survival instinct like completely yeah maybe yeah that yeah because the other side is that i feel like evo psych is like such an over like reified thing where it's like everything becomes biology, which I think is bullshit. But like there is a powerful sort of archetypal force of like you were saying in the documentary, the woman is an agent of chaos. The woman is an agent of becoming, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, like I feel, you know, like a lot of people, like a lot of like incel and ministry discourse is like centered around. Oh my God. Why? Um, why are they like this? This They brought chaos. (laughs) Yeah, no, I don't think, I don't mean any of my stuff, like, misogynistically. Like, I can get, like, angry about, like, when they, like, play the role of the succubus or lead some guy on. But, like, yeah, I think, obviously. like, the, yeah. the essential nature I'm talking about, I don't, like, yeah, I don't mean that in any, I'm a feminist. Like I say, 100%. I'm the world's, I'm the world's number one leading male feminist online. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Live, laugh, living, laughing, and loving. Oh that's... my gosh, that's the motto. <laughs> um, do, what about women though online who, um, who like I guess we like cast them aside as fem saws or whatever. But what do you think of like the rad fem poster that doesn't conform? In fact, like quite the opposite. They're basically they hover around the online right in particular, and they're kind of like they love being in cheeky, enervating force where they will chide all of the wants and pretensions and thoughts of the male. Like our favorite, um, our favorite one, Austrian, Austrian yeah, painter, uh, Rad Fem. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you, what do you feel like, <laughs> what do you think of, uh, these women? Like they, are they e-girls in themselves? Or are they like the anti e-girl? It's a great question. Um, I would say they're the anti e-girl, but that still has the word e-girl in there. So it's just like another kind of, form they're taking up this is one i haven't thought about but they're still getting attention like oh would they be... yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's like e-girl behavior in itself and just like the right wing girl takes a kind of contrarian position that you know i'm gonna have six kids and be barefoot uh to be rad femme is its own kind of contrarian position and i don't know how authentic they're being about it or if they're just doing it for the gays you know like they found something that worked and and they're taking that form really don't know well yeah because the political left like doesn't want them anymore because of the uh i i had this right the trans thing the trans thing i had this um i was mulling over an idea for an article called uh right wing and left wing misogyny and i had this idea that um, right wing misogyny is hyper focused on by academia, by the media, by Hollywood, and uh, by the sort of like apparatuses of biopower. But right wing misogyny mostly comes from a place of like resentment. I mean, there is like people that do it to such a poetic level, like uh, my mutual uh, Enzo. Like, there is something to be said about like I would say like female annihilationism. <laughs> that is like 
very like extreme, but at the same time has like a weird online poetics to it. Um, but right wing misogyny is mostly like resentment around the sort of machinations of women and how like the way that female social yeah. and group dynamics have become like the modern world as a political project or like political discourse is very like gynocentric in some ways. But yeah, sure. But that being said, like, I know it's like the right wing. They still, they'll still like worship, like they'll worship an idealized version of the woman as like a trad waifu. Um, but I said like the counterpoint to that is, would be um, left wing misogyny, which hates women on an ontological level in the sense that, with the the you know AGP stuff in particular, they like really want to erase like what a natural woman is. So I think it's like even more of an insidious mm. version of like they hate the being of the woman by subverting it. Whereas the right wing yeah. person, they're like just shut up hole, shut up hole, like go back to the kitchen. It's not like sure. is is an indifference there. It's not like an outright right. Like, you know and yeah. I want. So what I, do you think about that? I, I agree with this. I think the ideal male feminist is like the <clears throat> like the film producer or movie director who just like latches onto an actress as a muse and just like gives them all these chances to perform roles like over and over again. Mm. And I I think that's the ideal game to play. Um, you asked what I think about the right wing left wing feminism, uh, or not feminism. Sorry, like misogyny. I agree. Simple as. You simple as. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that there is something to it. Um, like, well, yeah. I, it is interesting too, like uh, the left wing misogyny of like erasing, like, I guess, what exactly are they erasing? Is it like the form of, they're trying to get rid of like the being which becomes butterfly or girl. Like they're trying to get rid of like the actress and they just want to keep the mask. And like, let anybody put on the mask. Oh my God! Exactly. Exa Holy crap! That is very true. They want to wear a dead skin mask. Of yeah. Them. <laughs> oh, dude, there's such a good. I wish I had. There's this Wojak, which is insane. I'll look for it after this. That's um. It's the like kind of the goth girl Wojak girl. If you've seen her. Wojina. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, but she has. Her whole face is stitched on, like, leather face with, like, weird makeup. It's this amazing meme. I, I have in the archives. I'll send it to you after this. Oh, man. <laughs> and that's a perfect way to describe, I think, yeah. the, the left wing is watching, in a sense. That was that was a Slayer reference, by the way. Dead skin. It's, uh, <laughs> if oh, I wasn't afraid of uh, copyright, I would have put it in. <laughs> I'll put it in the episode. <laughs> so maybe these, like, you know, rad, rad femme Austrian painters are just... I don't know. Maybe they're picking up on like the attack of the the essence that is, mm. and they're just like desperately defending that, like a clawing away. Because you know, women can get like you ever seen like a like a mother air protector bear cub. Like they can absolutely like shred. You know. Oh, they'll. So like, it's they could go through a car meter with their claws. Yeah. So it's possible they're doing that. It's kind of this like cornered female essence that's like sensing its threat and like clawing back and lashing out. But at the same time, I mean, they're online. They're being a poster and uh, they're, you know, I mean, I think she specifically is like always talks about bath and stuff. So it's like, <laughs> like there, there is absolutely an e-girl element to that, which is what we've discussed already. But also she, um, she, she talks about, and she, I know she, I think she knows like what pisses largely right-wing men off. And there's the takes that she keeps having that pisses me off as, you know, a poorly gentleman myself, to say the least. She says that the ideal man is, like, the twink boy, um, like, himbo, ethereal man, like, the beautiful boy archetype that Paglia talks about. And it's so frustrating because I'm like, no, the ideal man is a barrel-chested, barrel hairy yeah. um, barbarian. Like, that's... <laughs> But I guess so what like, does she want to do with this boy? Like, this ethereal angel soft boy, what, does she want to mother him or something? Is she teaching all of us boys online what we've done wrong, like school teacher? <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yo! Oh, God! That's so... Oh, that's great! That is... <laughs> I do notice that, like, there, there is this weird sort of um, mothering aspect to the rad femme. Like... Yeah. 
a lot of the anti, um, the pushback against, um, like, like my, my good friend, uh, Catherine default friend, she said, like, the thing is, you know, the anti, the detransitioner moment is upon us in terms of internet nice. trends and, uh, yeah, base giga Chad. Yes. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm good friends with Helena as well, who was recently on Tucker and, um, a big pushback was actually in the UK by rad femmes who are mothers. They have this network called mums now. Yeah. Like I'm <laughs> hearing to talks about this. <laughs> so it's like they're rad femmes. They're like Andrea Dworkin, but they're also mothers. So it's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. That's really, that's really weird. Um, I think I like the rad femme. I think I do like the rad femme, but still like we can't like pretty much cuck down to them, you know, in this yeah, kind of Yeah, yeah, they mammy. still have, they still have, they still like want like an atrocious gynocentric world, but I I tolerate them because they do have I I think uh, you need a, almost like an insight from women occasionally. As controversial oh, I agree. as it sounds, yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's absolutely. I mean, you need you need a woman to give birth, right? Right, right. You, you can't toss them out with the bathwater. <laughs> <laughs> with the afterbirth, yeah. Um, Have you seen this? Yeah, go ahead. You go. No, no. I was just gonna say that it's true. I feel like um, that like you can't really have a civilization that treats women just as breeding stock, like some like vicious right wing incels. They talk about like, Boring. yeah, like they talk about like, well, how are we going to solve the weight replacement rate? Well, I might as well have like, you know, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> awesome. it's, it's, might as well have Serbian like white eagles style uh, RP camps, uh, you know, but yeah. that's, but that's like a very small percent of like, yeah. I think that's horrible, man. It's terrible. Yeah, probably there's this trope I like, and maybe I'll write like a poem about it someday about a boy born in Sparta who realizes he's a ballerina on the inside. <laughs> and what I what I mean by this is like for the whole like breeding stock thing, it's like, well then what game is the guy gonna play? Because like one game that we play is the is the gender one. We play the game of attracting a female. You see birds do this and stuff. Right. You know? And then we do all the the simp or the I'm gonna save her LARP. It, it's just something we do with our time and it's like natural. But if you don't have the girl, let's say you're a vol cell, you're going to be playing some other game. And this is what I call the Napoleon mindset. It's you have some other project. But if you reduce like women to like breeding stock, then like every guy has to have some other project besides like the gendered game. Right. And not not every guy is suited for that or is going to want that. Yeah. Not every guy is equipped to go and dome uh, Bosnians or whatever. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it, it seems that th this sort of extreme um, negation of the feminine, especially the maternal, I don't think will produce very, um, very no. like flexible society that can withstand various, um, various Agreed. attacks. Yeah. Yeah. Or various like spiritual malaises. Uh, I advocate for weaning, which is like doing what you can to get away from the healing divine feminine. Like right, you become right. the erect figure on your own. Like that's the goal, becoming the hero. But there's still like a, uh, there is like a element to the feminine, like the Oracle of Delphi, you know, the healing bath waters, the right, fairy fountain, right. which is like, uh, like worthwhile on the quest, you know? Yeah. Like every, every sort of, um, extremist idea from a lot of like in self discourse that talks about, um, it, it's, it's a weird form of like replicating like, uh, like eugenic, like biopower, but not like eugenics in the sense of like the proper instinct of a woman is to avoid certain men and like, sure go towards right. like men that are advantageous to their, to their children. Like, yeah, this is why hypergamy is not immediately a bad thing. It's just that hypergamy has been hijacked by various nefarious forces without naming names. Um, right. You know, against any sort of holistic civilization, but you, like, you know what? Yeah, go ahead. One thing I was going to say on eugenics, I wrote a paper on this in college, which was, stupid. Oh God. <laughs> but nice. Um, nice. like there, my, my, counter response to it is that like i do think there is something to like the notion of falling in love maybe 
like a, a sort of magical destiny, which right. I guess this is romantic, and that that could be producing the Ubermensch in some way we're not aware of. A lot of people would say it would produce the opposite because if you're marrying someone, like the sort of modern notion of like marrying someone for love is like incredibly dysgenic in the sense that you're not caring about the greater context of your community, your religion, your culture, your race. But then I guess like a, a someone who is born out of a profound sense of love in some ways, I guess, is like a metaphysical, um, like qua like destiny in some ways or quest. But then, that's not how I see it. Well, how do you, how do you see it then? Oh, I don't know. I said that is how I see it. Oh, I, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it could be true, but then I guess like, like marriage was such a complicated thing back in the day because it had almost, it was almost like political horse trading, like in the sense that it yeah. cemented various like relationships among communities and, and even civilizations. Right. But nowadays, I mean, I guess proof is in the pudding that if like love is the only metric, then it's not going too well nowadays. I don't know. Well, also but, I doubt that people are actually getting married in love nowadays mm -hmm. and also man this is kind of off topic too but i've been wondering recently if like we ought to be nomadic rather than like domestic in love like agricultural in love just like follow the stars where they take you but this could be a dangerous idea so i don't know well there has been nomadic tribes throughout human history like that i mean that's what bap says that you know the pirate like this also came up when I was talking to Alex in her podcast is um, the sort of idea of the Bronze Age step warrior, the sort of modern day pirate that is conquering open space. It's like that kind of in a way grates with the more like natalist picture of yeah, like, being a family man. Like that's why they I think that's why trad cats don't like BAP because BAP is like his his ideal picture of masculinity is kind of like against being like oh, super yeah, being like a suburban trad dad or whatever, like. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's a sacrifice. It's another game you can play, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So I don't know if one is right or wrong. I tend to like the following the stars, go where like the wind blows you sort of thing. But I'm young, and there's there is something to notion of sacrifice. Yeah. How, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Twenty four. Oh, that's. Yeah, I think. Not super young. It's not super young, but like 24, 25 is like. I feel the age where you're sort of um, solidifying your ideas about the world and about your own life. Nice. So, yeah, it's like the one Sam Hyde uh, thing, uh, how to time travel as a man, where it's like 10 years erased. That's time you'll never get back. Like, Because <laughs> in your 20s, you do just kind of fuck around nowadays. But um, I'm almost 30. I'm going to be 30 in December. So that's kind of terrifying, actually. But like, uh -huh. I don't know. Um, but but yeah, so <laughs> so we cover the mommy GF, we cover the e girl. Um, I wanted to show you something. Let me yeah. um, let me get it for you here. And this is from the perspective of, I guess you could say the undesirable male. Um, yeah. So this is uh, this was from. Oh God, I hope it's still around. Where is it? Um, I think I saved it somewhere. But uh, I just. Undesirable males need to own it. I absolutely know some e-girls that even have like fetishes for these like ugly old French writers. Oh yeah, so <laughs> it's don't simp. And then I think you're yeah. I'm a man of spirit guy now. <laughs> <laughs> there was this um Oh god, I hope I saved it because uh the uh the I think it was from Atrazine Griper or whatever, but of course he's nice. The enemy race, the enemy racists, they keep getting, uh, they keep getting nuked, but it was essentially from, um, it, it was from this, uh, post from the forever alone board on like from years and years ago. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw this, but it was, um, it was basically saying like the, um, it was like the perspective of the, the undesirable male that, uh, fantasy has these romantic fantasies towards the woman but they can't envision themselves actually in that picture um and they can't fantasize mm. them because in a way to fantasize about themselves violates the image 
of that woman or like it violates the romantic ideal. So I wonder if, um, I wonder if like you can comment on, let me, let me try to look it up. Uh, that reminds me of this Woody Allen joke where he's like, I wouldn't want to be a part of any club that would take me as a member. Yeah. Kind of, kind of that could, (laughs) that is something, but, uh, yeah. So it basically, it was talking about that, like how, when you're a lonely man, like the romantic picture of, um, that you sort of like concoct in your head when you see a woman in real life, it's like it, you almost in a way you violate that romantic picture by putting yourself in there. But I want, I want so, to, yeah. I, this is one of the uh, uses of the e-girl in my opinion, if you can use it well, is when you get that romantic ideal and you can compare yourself to it and you go, oh, no way, like I can't even envision that, that gives you a chance to go, okay, who who would I have to become to maybe get her attention? Who would I have to be to... And even though there's a, there's a kind of simping in that, like changing yourself to please her, there is an accidental process of self-improvement, of becoming the hero in some sense, the kind of guy who can sweep her off her feet. And they have a use that way when like, they instantiate the, the ideal romantic feminine. If you can, instead of just not envision yourself with them, but go like, how could I get closer? Um, and don't lose yourself in simping, but like, you know, erect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, but I wonder like, the, oh, here it is. I found it. So let me, uh, thank God it, it wasn't, uh, let me just save it. So, cause you know, like I see these anime racists, they always, uh, oh, they, yeah, I did save it. Holy crap. Um, they always get yeeted off of Twitter. You know, they always post a uh, gamer words. They're awesome. So, yeah, I know. <laughs> they have, like, they, they, they do have a lot of crazy and interesting ideals. Um, and like they come from that one particular forum that I've read that it's like amazing, but this is what it says. Um, there's an ongoing, uh, half serious claim in our culture that men think about sex all the time, every 14 seconds or so that may be true for some guys, but not forever alone though. So this is like way back. This is like, you know, 2012 era memes after a while you stop being able to think about sex, at least the way other people do, you think about it abstractly or what, what or yeah. watching other people perform a stylized version of it alone in your room while you use your hand to joy, <laughs> to joyous, joylessly compete, complete a shadow, a sad shadow of the biological imperative, meaning, you know, jerking off. Yeah. 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 But you stop being able to imagine sex as something you could be a part of. You see a mm. woman in the springtime her midriff peeking out between the soft cotton of a shirt and the rough, love <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And the rough waist of a pair of jeans. You started to imagine her naked constructing a fantasy in detail, the way her breasts would sit against her chest, the soft down or abs, uh, absent thereof on her pubic hair. Um, the soft Dow. Oh my God. Um, and then you try to insert yourself in her presence and the fantasy crumbles to dust under the weight of its mm. own absurdity. You know that there's no claim. <laughs> no chain of events, no course of action that could lead to the ill-defined Im- imaginary room where you two would meet an act of carnal Congress. There is no way to there from where you, <laughs> there's no way to there from where you are. It's not even an alternate universe. It's an inconceivable one. It's like trying to yeah. imagine a world where everyone else is the same, except elephants floating around he- like helium balloons in the sky and have to anchor it and have to anchor themselves by trunk or they'll float away an inherently absurd thought. The idea that you and her being intimate. So you look away from the tiny sliver of skin, trying to keep your face from contorting in pain and bitterness where other men might smile at her direction. You don't because your smile sucks. You suck forever alone. <laughs> that's amazing. Whoa, but that's, I've been there. I've, I'm going to be honest. I've yeah. been there, you know? Uh, there's a few things I thought about that. What I had this post I made where it's Ryan Gosling walking down the grocery store aisle. He sees the girl, you know, where he just turns and walks to the other aisle. <laughs> um, so I, I wrote about that where I said, um, like sometimes, like if I have like a crush on a girl, and this is kind of true now. I don't talk to her, um, and I described it as like. I may like look at her like Ryan Gosling here for a moment, like you read a biography of somebody who you know dies at the end. There's this kind of like sad distance from like engagement with the object. Exactly, exactly. It's it's very Lacanian mm. in a way. It's um. Um, 
the uh, the desire for the the real object of desire the la petite a is not the actual desire it's like just yeah. it's a subterfuge for it but uh, there's a word for it i forget the ob- cause object cause of desire or something like this yeah something uh, like that zizek talks about a couple things one he talks about uh you'll never actually fall in love with somebody perfect like the ideal feminine there was some study done in france where they showed two supermodels one was perfect like literally perfect and the other one had a couple like flaws she had like a mole or something Mm. Uh, so like just slightly less beautiful but more real and then they asked um like france or paris like who would you rather take out to dinner and pretty much everybody or you know the majority chose the flawed girl even though she looked slightly less perfect so uh i'm trying to get to something there there's also another zizek quote in the abercrombie and fitch magazine where he talks about nudism actually being unattractive um what's more attractive is when like the girl has just like some revealing clothing that causes you to imagine the ideal form underneath and like that's what will allure you oh yeah that's true because all eroticism is suggestion um yeah in in uh for example when i was doing my uh ma a big uh in philosophy the one the philosophy one is um a lot of it was about uh chinese and japanese taoist ink painting and uh how there's this yeah there's i I'll, one day i'll release my paper i mean i have to edit it but you know um it was about there was this one uh chapter in this book it's called the great image has no form by this French sinologist. His name was uh, François Julien. And he wrote a, this one chapter called The Impossible Nude, how the figures within uh, Chinese literati painting, they are always with clothing. They look alien. They're almost like Chavanet figures, um, would be like the closest Western equivalent. And uh, basically, the like the idea of beauty in the Orient is not full presence of the subject. There's always right. like... There has to be a mysteriousness. There has to be a sort of becoming there. Um, yeah. And so that I think is the idea of all eroticism because like in apparently in nudist colonies, like you don't have like that much more sex than the median average of people. Like, it's not about that. I think it's like, there are some like porn tropes where it's like, you know, uh, let's be nudist. And then you have sex, but like, there's something about like the revealing of the feminine that is most yeah. erotic, right? So, but nowadays, like, oh. we're so, like, imbued with, like, pornography and OnlyFans and, like, every woman can now become a porn star in some ways, which is kind yeah. of, like, yeah. People got so mad when Belle Delphine actually did porn because uh, for the longest time, she just was suggestive, right? right? And she had a huge following and, like, proud simps. And then as soon as, like, I forget, like, a year ago or something, she actually, like, released a porn video. And, like, people were just so mad about it. And there's, a, there's a really good, one of those, like, Hitler edits, you know, where he's, like, like my fear, and he starts, like, yelling and having a freak out. <laughs> From downfall, yeah. And so it's pretty funny. It's, like, uh, just, like, they're, like, she released a porno. And he's, like, no! And he just has a freak, <laughs> freak out. He's, like, I, I believe that her, my idea of her is ruined, is what he says. Yeah, that's it's what... Not- yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you go. No, no, that was um, meme analysis did a video on it, if I recall, back a year ago, where it's like the ideal is ruined because, like, you like the porn videos from what I've heard, they're not even that particularly good. That's what I hear too. Like they're not like a like a basic like five out of ten mid OnlyFans girl can probably have a following of simp's by doing like grody like homemade porn videos. Uh, because I feel like, you know, like you were saying, it reminds me of that Oscar Wilde quote, um, true beauty requires ugliness in that, like, yeah. you know, beauty requires some sort of defect that can, that has a particularity to how you view what is be- beautiful, what other people can I, view as like an off-putting thing. So now I'm finding that the fact that Belle Delphine did porn is her defect, which makes me love her more. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> but the fact that um, she has a BF, too, that kind of, like... Oh, that's horrible, man. Yeah, like, how can... That's imagine so being that guy, though. Imagine being him. 
Like, Dude, cucks are getting. That's another like subject of interest to me. Is like how much more popular like cuck culture is becoming for guys. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, it is a force now. It's yeah. Yeah. I wonder, but like, cause think of it, like, if you were, um, like, I, I guess, like, if if you were with someone who is popular online, like, there's something particular about dating like an e girl that has a following, that's almost yeah. like a strange form of cuckoldry in some ways because like yeah but if they use their body like i don't know it's kind of i felt that a little bit i don't want to get too into it um yeah i mean because they're because then they go out there and you just say post like a hot selfie why yeah (laughs) like you, you want somebody else's gaze not mine you know exactly exactly like i i remember talking about this once um I was talking about this with my friend Vera, um, fat lover, you know, on Twitter. Um, yeah. And she like, the thing is like, she resists the label E girl because she like posts like selfies that are like at least somewhat suggestive just by like the nature of her body type, I feel is like, you know, she can't avoid it, but she like, she like despises getting like these creepy, um, like DMS by guys like simping over her. Like she hates that and she resists yeah. like the label of e-girl so i wonder like it must take like a psychic toll to like like i know like the, the usual stuff is like you know oh all these e-girls they get attention so why would they want attention from me they can't have like a functioning relationship but i wonder if it does like tax them psychologically and like almost spiritually to like constantly be the object of desire like i wonder uh I, I doubt it. I don't know. I feel like it's kind of fuel for them, like the Tinkerbell thing. I mean, it might tax them if they have to interact with Sims, or if they're really bothered, right? Like this one girl you're talking about, like a creepy DM. Um, but barring that, no, I, I think it's it's fuel for them. Hmm. It could be. It could be. They certainly... Could be. Like... <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps. Um no, it is fuel for them. It is true. Like I mean, I'm trying to be nice, but the reality is is that a lot of e-girls it's like their drug. Like this is why social media has been a disaster for social media. That's insane. Yeah. And its consequences have been disaster for women, <laughs> you know. You I know, but we it's like a hyper I hyper I don't know the word, like of like the forums. I think you used to have the small village, right? And you would have the gaze of, you know, the boys in your village. And then they would want you to shape up as one of these essential feminine roles, whether you're the damsel in distress, the mother, the prostitute, something, succubus. Um, I mean, they would kind of loosely um, incorporate this form. And then you get, like, in the 1940s, like, the first movie, Stars, which is interesting that we use, like, you know, like, celestial, Mm -hmm. uh, celebrity terminology, um, orbiters, right? And, um the you'd get these stars like marilyn monroe audrey hepburn who had a wider audience name they really started to show us archetypal female roles for the first time i think outside of mythology um but now online it's not just these stars that are doing it it's like random 17 year old girls like in their bedroom are like getting these massive amounts of attention and like comparing notes with each other and staring at each other and really almost perfecting um these roles to the point where they're even cosplaying the succubus. They're being mommy girlfriend, posting breast milk videos. Like they've tapped into these archetypal female roles uh, because of the male gaze that the internet has allowed. And they're really perfecting it outside of mythology. No, it's true. I mean, like you you mentioned um, the one film with Audrey Hepburn uh, where she yeah. leaves, leaves her rich family and like she goes on the streets of Rome with gangsters and with, you know, petty criminals. But um, if you look at the lives of both Marilyn Monroe and Audrey Hepburn, they were sort of like the sacrificial lambs of like the Hollywood yes. starlet. Like they had terrible, disastrous personal lives. And uh, so make of that what you will. <laughs> like, I think most actresses yeah. probably have some kind of like weird satanic cult like baggage, I guess, in Hollywood. Well, the E-Girl is... The e-girl is becoming an actress. The e-girl is an actress. So you used to have to be like maybe a movie star to be an actress. These girls online who are performing these roles are actually actresses. They're essentially the same thing. They have an audience. They have the gaze on them. They're shaping up and performing these roles. It's just like improvised and it's method acting. 
It's not scripted. <laughs> exactly. Um, but do you feel like like there is obviously the like, simp energy there? But it's it's funny, like all like with when it comes to me, for instance, um, I'm like, you know, it's kind of like one of those weird like memes or like whatever where people are like, oh, you're a simp, Geo, you're a simp, you're a simp. But I don't um I don't like have like e-girls like pouring into my DMs right. that aren't like bots or whatever. Like it seems like all of the like I, you know, all the women I interact with online are pretty much taken. I mean, there's some that I would fancy myself with, but it's like not like I don't know. I don't it's I think right. like some men manage to like resist like that kind so, of attention. I don't know. I am a simp to the divine feminine and I don't I don't have any specific like e-girl or anything who captures my attention like this. I can see in them like moments of them like playing some like role and I can mm -hmm. like see oh this e-girl's playing this role of the of the divine feminine. This one's playing this role and admire that but not actually like engage with them. Yeah, because to engage with them like the real world externalities right. like an online relationship is so great. I mean, but it's, um, yeah. Oh, mm, I don't know. I did, don't you, get... did you end up meeting your girlfriend in real life, by the way, the e-girl? Or... We moved in together. That's how, that's exactly what I was going to go into. Yeah, we moved in together. Holy crap. Then, yeah. You were living the dream, uh, my brother. You were living the dream. <laughs> well, no, I the What was a dream got like a more real and became more like a nightmare, right? Or it just like, it's like you wake up from the dream into like a screaming world like you you're birthed into the real world from the online and just like that there's blood and crying and screaming it was like that holy crap <laughs> so, yeah i mean there was like not to downplay the whole thing but definitely the online ideal was uh exactly that it was more ideal it was much more fantastic romantic and then uh, going in the real world uh from e-dating to like a moving in together completely different was she was she conventionally attractive you would say in terms of like yeah object okay so was it that um you know i remember that viral tweet last year where it said that the goal of being online is to like basically live in your room and to convince another woman to come and live in your room with you but you did that <laughs> so it's like yeah you know did what happened no. though is it just that you like the illusion was so powerful, but then when you lived with this woman, was her real life sort of like a mess or was it that the illusion was what you fell in love with, not her? Yeah, that's the great question. I would say it's absolutely the illusion. And did 100%. you break it off? Did you break it off with her? Or? No, she broke it off with me. Oh, uh, basically, man. Yeah. Basically Rude. how it worked was like, uh, like, yeah, I, I I think I'd fallen in love with the illusion initially, and like as like tough as the relationship was getting, and it was becoming so apparently different from like the online thing, I was a baby refusing to wean. I was like, no, no, my ideal, the imaginary, and like yeah, it was such a painful process. Man, yeah. but what? Why did she? Did she give you a reason? I guess they never give you like a solid reason. That's. Uh, yeah, but um, <laughs> I'm not, not going to get into it. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. But it is it's very interesting because I think like you are um, uniquely equipped to write and to produce a series, a documentary about this because you've sort of lived it. You've like lived. Yeah, thank you. You've achieved like the getting the e-girl. But it, yeah, but then you you went through the, like, it's like you speed, you speed ran the whole cycle of now I achieve my e-girl. Now I get the perfect, the like sort of perfection, the image, but then, um, that slowly dematerializes after time. And that process Thanks. is painful. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too. I'm grateful that I'm having the experience to produce this now, because like I said, I wrote this book before the e-relationship, like, um, this one, and I was going to publish it, and oh, I had all these ideas about the online gender studies, existentialism, and then I, I actually get into this relationship, and um, that took all my attention, and I left the book aside. Oh um, no! Yeah. No, you, well, you stopped being a Napoleon at that point. Exactly. I I 
basically castrated. I got, you know, it's like the erection was lost and I melted down myself into soft formlessness. And just like, there's a feminine nature to me where like, when I'm with a girl, I tend to be a bit of a moon. And instead of like being an erect pillar myself, I want to like reflect them. So right. that's my own personal issue. But so I spent almost two years, like I'd thrown away this book and was dedicated to the relationship, which ended poorly. And then I was like upset back in the fall. I was like, damn, like, this book never happened and the relationship ended poorly what was the point of the sacrifice um and then it was just this spring man like second star to the right like came in gave me wind and i was like i'm actually gonna go back um do this piece of work put in new stuff that i've kind of learned coming out the other side and turn it into these youtube video essays whatever these are would you ever release the book in the future would you go back to working on yeah. it yeah i would like to I think you should. I think you would, you could probably float it to uh antelope pill or Imperium press or something. I think, nice. or, or just self publish. Yeah. I mean, I feel, cause I feel like a lot of like right wing publishers, they're kind of like, they're looking for a specific thing. Um, and you have to know people and stuff like that. And, um, hey, I'll check that out. Yeah. But, uh, there was a one part, um, you mentioned, you mentioned a few like very famous online, like extremely online memes. Um, the, the Britney Spears thing is fascinating to me because as a millennial of that generation, um, we all grew up with Britney Spears and then when Britney, uh, went crazy and then she went into, you know, the protectorship or whatever, then what does she do? As soon as she comes out of it, as soon as the free Britney simps get their way, she starts posting nudes and right. My friend Billy Pratt actually on Twitter, um, he like, you know, was he's an OG of the manosphere and he writes a lot about this in his book, uh, Welcome to Hell. Oh, yeah. Cool. And uh, he like was so devastated by it because like he's like, Britney was our queen, our millennial queen, our Gen X millennial yeah. queen. And now she's posting pictures of her butthole online. And it's like, no, <laughs> it's, 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 she's her, old and saggy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's there's a sort of supreme violation because I think like zoomers don't remember how popular Britney was like just how I had an, yeah, I had an older sister. That's all I'm saying. So that's kind of how I got my familiarity. Yeah. Like Britney was everywhere back in like 2001, you know, like it was (laughs) like it, like my, my first YouTube video was, um, I think maybe one more time, whatever the one where she's the school girl. I remember watching that on like a PC in like 2004 or something. <laughs> oh man. See, this is, this is like a weird thing. How we even like have nostalgia over the early internet. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I do as well. There, the, Cause I know it's like the way you post on Twitter, you also have like the aesthetics of, um, I guess it's becoming yeah. more popular now, like the Y2K thing. I think. Um, no, I was OG. Yeah. I was online really young on forums. Yeah. Like, so you know about like the sort of. All, the cat, as- all this kind of, you know. Yeah. The aesthetic bricolage of like forum culture and like the early internet. And um, like, I noticed like it, it has like a diverse appeal. Like, I think I've talked a lot about like early 2000s futurism And like sort of the aesthetics of it, like there's a lot of accounts, like I think with NFT culture, there's something there. There's a lot of Instagram accounts, like the e-girl adopts early internet aesthetics. Yeah. Um, Like my good friend, Impossible Princess on Twitter, she, uh. I I know her too. She's my friend as well. Yeah. Yeah. She, um, did you hear the podcast she did with Yana? Um, hate fiction. Um, I, I listened to it and she was talking about, um, Put it this way, like, I'm not going to disclose, but my friend Cindy, uh, Impossible Princess, she, like, knows a lot about this stuff, like, on an academic level, um, about, like, design and so forth. And she was talking about how the e-girl adopts internet aesthetics of the early internet when things were very much decentralized and, like, they were almost fuzzy and they, like, like the Y2K thing. Um, I noticed the Milady nft project is sort of similar there's a lot of like early internet stuff of course um i think like milady comes from like the post kaliak thing but uh she was she was talking about like the e-girl how like women on the early internet they were into the confessional thing 
but they were anonymous. But the yeah. e-girl is anything but anonymous. So, like, what change do you think? Like, why is the e-girl almost like a violation of I, the early internet femcel? <laughs> it has to do with the avatar, I think. Because the e-girl now is, like, represented in the avatar, and the avatar has its own, like, entity. Like, when, when guys are thinking about the girl, they're not actually thinking about the e-girl. They're thinking about the avatar she creates, which is just, like, little moments of herself right. um, and instances. The the online internet forum posting wasn't you weren't much of an avatar you know at first you were just an instance of text you weren't a persona right um, eventually you could develop it and then we got more into avatars we even put ourselves in bodies like on Club Penguin Gaia Online RuneScape and then we realized why are we in bodies when we're going online and we got rid of that and now we're we're kind of going back to the forum posting thing but. The, we develop personas, avatars, you have an account, you know, you're Bronze Age pervert, you right. have a, a picture that gets associated with you, you develop a brand. And so even if it's anonymous, in a sense, you've created this tulpa I'm talking about, the avatar and the e-girl instantiates herself in the tulpa who we simp around and that's not anonymous. Yeah, exactly. That's that's great because um, there there is a... Uh... <laughs> there, like what you mentioned about like how forum culture changed into the early internet uh the like around the early 2000s you had the sort of like you become an, a digital body you have, so weird yeah you have like second life um i often tell the story of when i was a kid i was at my grand my grandparents house and i was watching um this uh here in canada we have tvo here on tv ontario and there was this like science, uh, pop culture, science program. And they were talking about Second Life, that it was like this fundamental, important thing that was going to change the world. And this was like around 2002. And nice. uh, yeah, and I remember like the early internet model of you have a digital avatar that can like interact in virtual worlds. And like, so funny. Yeah, because then what happened was like consumer capitalism took over that model as like being inefficient. And now it's like, the Amazon like point and click, like like well, uh, yeah, social I, media. I disagree with your analysis of it being uh, like because like corporate took it over. That's funny. The word corporate is like body, but no, mm -hmm. I think uh, I think that we go online to escape physical form. I mean, the fact that like you're in Canada right now, I'm in Southern California, and we're having a conversation. Like it's exactly this. I think going online, the internet. The telephone was an early version of this. Um, yeah, escaping matter and like going to a non-local reality. And the early internet was just like this. I think when we got into bodies on things like RuneScape, for example, yeah, yeah. we took a step back. Like, why would we trap ourselves in like a fake matter when we go online to escape it? Some quick anecdote. I, I used to play like things like Club Penguin and Guy Online where you're one of these avatars walking yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. So funny that like, if you wanted to not talk to somebody, you would walk away and then they couldn't find you. You could hide. <laughs> you would literally hide behind something and then they couldn't find you and you could avoid them. Like insane. And now we're just like the timeline is just like you just throw yourself out there. It's it's very different. You can't avoid discourse, especially on Twitter. It's it's like twenty it's internet time is like twenty four seven. Yeah. It's like it is the it's like what Baudrillard talks about in the book America. I recently did a stream where I read some passages on it. And uh, he talks about how America is this perfect deterritorialized space where everything is surface. Everything is like yeah. desert in the sense. Olive Garden? Yeah, Olive you Garden. Mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> everything is desert in the sense that it's a plane without the markers of history. And so. Mm everything operates with speed and intensity and speed leads to this form of disappearance. So discourse itself, the speed of discourse you find on Twitter, it's almost yeah. like there's a disappearance of the subject because you're Whoa. interacting so much that it's 24 seven. There's no escape. Dude, Anyone dude. can at you, you know? Yeah. But So do you I think, think that, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I think that um, human evolution, to some extent, is maybe sped up by the internet and like the rapid exchange of information and whatnot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, what were you saying? No, no, yes, I was agreeing with you. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> but like elaborate when that thought, like with human evolution, do you, do you think it's that because we have a capacity to the sort of parse like diverse sources of information or. Sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Oh, I meant like, d does it aid evolution in the sense that we're now capable of um, taking in a lot of like yeah. diverse information in other words? Yes. And do you think like to, to get back to the e-girl, do you think that the e-girl is it a regression of internet culture? Or do you think it's sort of like, cause they obviously have an avatar, they have a body, right. but, but that body becomes like, uh, becomes deterritorialized. It's almost like I remember, um, mm -hmm. zero HP Lovecraft mentioned this, the one porn star or sorry, she was a cam girl that said that it was almost like she wasn't in control of her body anymore. Yes. Like the simps would ask her, like they would pay her money to do something with like a part of her body. And it was almost like she had, like she was a total alienation there. Um, that's, I'm not exactly sure what to say. One point I want to bring up is I, I haven't fleshed it out super well. And I think the term fleshing out is interesting, but this concept <laughs> of like what I call digital touch that the e-girl performs, uh, these little things she can do, like, I notice they tend to, like, make subtle references to their body. Like, they'll post about their tummy, you know? Yeah, tongue and, like, posting, yes. Yeah. Make us, like, um, imagine more of their body, you know? Um, or, like, they'll be like, my skin is soft. And then, like, we have to kind of create the body for them. And um, there's other funny things, too, about touch. Small anecdote. I like how the phone screen gets warm. Um, mm -hmm. when I touch it sometimes <laughs> and like if you turn on notifications for an e-girl like the one trapped in your phone it'll your phone can like little buzz uh sing you know it'll it'll ding and move around when she tweets if you turn on notifications yeah yeah there's ways to make her more real I think you just have autism that's could be what it's <laughs> no I'm kidding <laughs> it's, it's something <laughs> no but it is true like people think like uh, some people listening to this would be like oh that's insane but it's true though you do like especially if you have an older phone it's like but like I recently uh I recently updated my phone after like six years and it is like a different experience but it is true like the little black screen um it becomes like an attachment into like the somatic like you can touch it that you can send like when the e-girl mimics different yeah. like bodily like attributes it's like <laughs> there is something very somatizing there but it's like but then that's still an abstraction though that's still like you're not actually touching you're not feeling a real girl's um Absolutely. soft skin right so right what were you saying uh, I wanted to hear more or maybe respond better to your last point. I think you were talking about something about the avatar or like the modern e-girl is, is what she's, is she a regressive force in the sense that she has a body and she's not pure discourse or pure like forum culture posting. Do you feel like the fact that she is a face, she is an avatar mm. is like, is it, is it like almost like a violation of like, I guess the, ethic of no i uh i don't know man i think there's a couple things going on one what she's doing is a slightly different game where she's also playing with like the archetypal or divine feminine mm -hmm. so like getting away from the online itself i think she's perfecting forms of female roles or like really showing them to us and they're able to like exchange with each other where it's succubus mom whoever it is mommy girlfriend um and so outside of the internet ethics they're doing something kind of cool on there where like they're like hyper uh, uh speeding up the process that celebrities were doing and pop stars were doing of like showing off an ideal feminine form uh girls on are using the online to do this with each other are they breaking some internet ethic they don't they're worse if they're like a cam girl or yeah. something like this if it's like a just an e girl who has like a Twitter account, uh, I think she's okay, even though she has the avatar, because she's still doing the cool online thing where she's like everywhere at once. See, that's the uh. thing. Everywhere at once, that is the sort of essence of like the aesthetic yeah. of disappearance, right? Like that is yeah. the e girl 
like most people on the online disappear into the nothingness of information but well so they abandon body and form to an extent but they become what i call like a, a pop star where, where they become pixel right instead of right, matter right. It, pixel is just light pixel is is like instantiations of light and then they become these pop stars they become these stars these light have their beings. own gravity yeah exactly in orbit and if you notice like e-girls were always obsessed with like orbs and like beings of light and, and crystals and <laughs> yeah yeah new age yeah. new age woo yeah um part four of the e-girl documentary which maybe is out today if not tomorrow is about some of this oh that's fascinating i i i'm desperate to see it um but that is true a lot of the e-girls they they are obsessed with like light with um the crystals the new age stuff the the uh astronomy sorry astrology not astronomy what am i talking about astrology it's like you know that meme uh I just nutted the, in this girl and she's giving me crystals. Like, <laughs> Oh yeah. But do you think, think that they're breaking some internet ethic with their like avatar or what do you think about this? I think that the quote unquote internet ethic that comes from forum culture is very much like a left brain male phenomenon. It's very much like the older form of like no girls on the internet and how like, like, um, like gay, um, Chris Gabriel, uh, meme analysis, he has that idea of the digital anima where even though like the internet still is kind of like a largely male space in terms of being like terminally online, there still is, it's like a womb entity. It's like the maternal force that holds these little boys into their games. But yeah, I feel like it's a violation in the sense that it's going against an older model of anonymity. It's going against the sort of very like male orientated like info brain but that being said like i mean nowadays that's sort of like the i think the e-girl is given a space to violate that ethic because they take on a more significant role but that can be used for good or evil so i don't know i hear you you're not totally i mean you have an avatar right yeah, but I'm also a face and a name. I use my face and my real name. Yeah, 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 yeah I yeah. understand. Yeah, so the older, like, as much as I like it, I do realize that there are inherent limitations to any sort of, like, online movement or group or whatever that is purely anonymous. But at the it's same weird. time... Yeah, it's weird, though. I mean... There seems to be a, a discourse. Like, There's, like, a competition when we go online, which I see going online as an escape from form. That's like mm. essentially what I think is going on. Uh, but I there's a combating game between whether we go completely formless, right? And just like instantiate like an idea for a moment or something. Right. Or if we develop bodies and we go back and forth online, people compete. Like like we were talking about, you know, some of these older internet platforms you would be a walking around body. Yes. And we we get rid of that. And now we're kind of building up avatars and personas again you know we're cooler. building up bodies again we're and, and notice how the zoomer loves the aesthetic of the early internet where or like the mid the mid internet where we did build these like you know gaia online um clubhouse yeah. penguin uh, clubhouse um second life to an extent i mean of course the vr chat thing like it seems that there is a fascination with um, the digital body. There's this essay, actually, you can find. I think it's called Digital Bodies. That's quite fascinating. Like, it's about a lot of the um, early, like, uh, a lot of, like, the early internet stuff where artists were getting in on the grift, where they are like, okay, what if we can create works of art that centers around the body within the space of technological nice. uh, within, like, digital technology? And there's a lot of fascinating work in that regard, and I feel like there still is a lot of stuff to explore, but because we kind of like are like, we kind of are like at the face of the monolith as monkeys, like beating uh. each other with sticks. Like we kind of are like monkeys with AK-47s in terms of like giving people this powerful technological apparatus and then yeah. people losing themselves in it. But what you yeah. said about like the internet creates a form of formlessness. I mean, that's amazing. That is like, you have like a lot of postmodern philosophers like Virilio and like Baudrillard who almost predict this, 
like nice. yeah, like the aesthetics of disappearance is a, a great book by um by Virilio. Um I I talked about this with my friend Astral. But it's it is true, like the more that you interact with them with this interface of just pure text and pure thought and even pure image, even the image itself is no longer a body, but rather it's like a signpost. Like the like the, for example, yeah. the Ray Wing bodybuilder, I think, is like the other equivalent yeah. of like it's not about you as someone who has a sculpted body. It's more of like the yeah. group identification that you are a right wing bodybuilder or you are an e-girl or whatever, right? I think it's interesting that it's called a, a body of work. Mm, uh, like yeah. I'm online and my Twitter feed is my body of work, you know, like that's what makes me up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. it's very interesting um like but then this body of work it sort of like spans it's deterritorialized it's it's like throughout different blogs right. and youtube comments and like i'm obsessed with centralizing all of my work i just haven't yeah. found a good way to do it apart from like article compilations so but, you're developing a body online yeah oh yeah you definitely really... yeah yeah um w there's a fun question which is like where does the e-girl go between tweets? Oh, I yeah. wonder. Yeah. I wonder. Like, um, it is, yeah. Because There's, is there an e-girl in between tweets? That's the, that's the question. Oh. There's, um, <laughs> I thought, it's so funny, man. I, I really like the distinction between the avatar and the person. It's this point I brought up earlier that like Belle Delphine's going to die one day. <laughs> yeah. She's, she's dying gonna... tomorrow. <laughs> But I could, if she, if Belle Delphine died tomorrow, a year from now, I could pull her out of my phone, like whenever I want to, you know? It's like dead porn stars. It's weird. Wow. Yeah. It's like you can see them in an act of carnality long after they're gone. Like something that is unique and like evanescent, or it rather should be unique and evanescent, but yet like it persists yeah. on and like, yeah. Yeah, the dead porn star thing her. is interesting. No, it's not her. No, exactly. Right. It's this thing we create. And then my question, and this one's fun, but it's I brought it up. Does this thing you create have a kind of egregore itself where it does take on its own like will in a sense, right? Is it just right. random pixel? Or because you know, you can put energy into things, then you wonder if there is some kind of like am I being influenced by my avatar in some sense? Like, does the idea of crooner cause me to do things that I wouldn't do otherwise? Oh, definitely. I think even if, yeah. like, even if you like post your real name and face, like, which would I do, you know, like I did it for a variety of reasons. I mean, maybe cause I don't have anything to lose, but also like if I were to LARP as something that I'm not and people like found out who I was, yeah. it would be devastating. Like if I were to LARP as like La Epic Bronze Age Step Warrior and they see like <sighs> this fucking fat dude, that's like, what's going to happen? Like, <laughs> You know, but I, I do, yeah. I do feel that even if you do post your real name and face, there is a moment where you'll tweet something or you'll write something and you're consciously aware of like the milieu that you're in. And it's like, oh, I wouldn't have done that otherwise. I wouldn't have framed it in such a way other. And if I'm being caught, if I'm not being consciously aware of like an audience or a group. So that is true. I mean, it's very it's a very like effective form of like social control in a lot of ways because you're policing yourself. Like what if the e-girl like came out with a tweet of like, um, you know, I don't want attention today. Like what would, <laughs> like what would happen? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, but then, but then some guys would get off on that. Like, I think this is the rad femme thing again. Like some men, they love when women are annoying for some reason. I don't know. Like we make fun of it, but it's like the act of making fun of like women being annoying online. It's like, you're still consenting to it. So I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Fun anecdote just about uh, going online to be formless. Apparently the dolphin ancestor, which is like maybe related to wolves, uh, was like a land mammal that went like back into the water. Mm, and that's right. Yeah. And women love dolphins. 
the the poetic way to think about it is like they went to go be uh, like weightless again in some sense you know yeah and uh yeah. I think the whatever we're doing online is tapping into, tapping into, yeah, it gets mysterious here. What's like what Freud called the oceanic feeling? Um, oh. Yeah, like this sort of like sense of boundlessness, the sense of like what, the, the numinous. One of my favorite questions too is on what line? Hmm, on what line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are we talking about? So I kind of think... We talk about like the internet work, right? Of right. being, uh, there's we always have these things like food webs, like or like, you know, chains of hierarchy. So there's like in Chinese mythology and stuff, this idea that there's literally like invisible threads or lines which connect people to each other, mm -hmm. and as like. Um, history teleologically progresses like these lines get thinner and thinner so like people are drawn towards each other but there's always this notion of like lines like there's like lines invisible lines between people which you can affect like you can cut that line by like breaking breaking it off with somebody right yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> like, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna cut them off from my life um and like these lines between you between people the like the invisible ones you can vibrate them right by like what you do you can affect the vibe like the vibe between people it's like i think this invisible line vibrating and so on what line on what line i think online has you know something to do with this like invisible network which connects being and that's why i mean it's a fucking miracle it is that you're you're in canada right now i'm in southern california and we're chit-chatting like that's insane instantaneously like, yeah you post on, you can affect people's vibe online like how do you do that right you can like post out there and change the vibe like even of the <laughs> world like content creators like famous people from their bedrooms do something that seems almost telepathic and suddenly like all millions of people around the world just had their vibe shifted like it's insane it is insane it's 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 very much akin to the gutenberg press or splitting the atom um like when you say what is online there still is like the sense that people who are internet dwellers who are like terminally online they're like part of a community but really that's again from the early internet when it was like very like closed off to most quote unquote normies. But now it's like the world has become the online, you know, especially in the past two years, but yet we still have that like, Oh, I'm being online. Like this is a unified thing, but it's not a unified thing because people are like ghettoized into their little corners or their little like wavelengths and their lines uh, on, on, you know, on the internet. So, but it is, it is fascinating though, how these lines, they form like an endless like chain, a rhizome of significance. Like you can go into any other line. I mean, maybe you're not be you might not be accepted, but like the line is still there. It's still open. There's very th as much as like corporations and governments try to police it. There's always going to be like a frontier element to the internet. So yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, before we go about the live, laugh, love thing. I know that was a meme. Oh, so good. A year ago or so with people like uh, Ulysses. But what is the ethic of live, laugh, love? And how does Elliot Rodgers yeah. play into this? Okay. Um, so I think that's like a, a heroic philosophy because there's like, there's literally suffering in life. Um, and there's things you can do about that. Like if you get hurt, yeah, you you have the choice of, you know, taking your hurt and resentment and then acting it back on the world in revenge and making the world a literal worse place. And mm -hmm. that's an option. Like, you can do this, but it you don't have to do this. Like, it would be cool and heroic even, hero-pilled, to take the, like, the experience, allow yourself to feel... And like, regardless, you're going to live, right? You're living through this. That's the ups and downs. Laugh, laugh and love. And so like, you can take your, your tragedy, your pain, and then deal with it 
And in doing so, show people how they themselves, through your example, can deal with the tragedy and suffering of life and still end up being heroic and saving others. This is just another way. It's almost as uh, what Nietzsche said uh, when he talked about serious laughter. It's like you're laughing at the absurdity of the world, but you're doing so in such a way that informs um, who who your higher self is in a way. And I feel like a lot of like discourse, especially in our spaces, are sort of like, you know, the opposite of live, laugh, love. It's very like black pilling. And, you know, I'm certainly yeah. a part of this as well. But like the live, laugh, love thing was an interesting meme plex because it's it comes from like spoofing like you know the typical like i guess you would say like wine ant literature yeah like, yeah yeah you, you pray love you know like this sort of like self affirmation like self help bullshit culture but yet if you take that seriously um in the online world i mean now more than ever i think you can have the capacity to escape into like this live laugh love thing like you can escape so, into choosing not to despair in the world yeah and not even just choosing to not despair yourself but being in some sense maybe a guiding light for others yeah. if you can if, if you could be in the same sort of situation elliot roger was and in some sense come out heroic or helping people saving somebody um and demonstrating that to others i think that just makes the world a better place And this is just a way you don't have to do it but it's another way and it's probably i mean you're laughing right live laugh love it's better than being blackpilled i remember uh, watching it and um it uh you, you some of your tweets that you were putting in the documentary about elliot roger um i love him yeah saint elliot peace be upon him yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, oh man, that's controversial, but uh, it's, it was one of us. He was one of us though. It's exactly the thing. Yeah, he was, but that's why. Yeah. No, no. I was going to say that, um, if you're familiar with the band Mastodon, they, uh, have this one album, crack the sky where it's like this like album story where the soul of Rasputin is like, uh, embodied into, uh, I forgot the whole thing, but it's like the soul of Rasputin like comes alive again in this other person. And it's like the soul in and, and this one tweet you had, it's almost like the soul of Elliot like lives throughout us and it's exactly. like, and how we can choose to right. like, be informed. Redeem. Yeah. Be redeemed. Exactly. Like him being redeemed. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. That's totally what I think. I have this edit of him smiling and like holding a wine glass with blonde hair and it says live, laugh, love on like a sign behind him. <laughs> you know, there's this guy on Twitter. I can't remember his username. Who DMs me sometimes that lives in Elliot Rogers' old apartment. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And I want to move in there, but at least this guy's there too. And I think if he from that place can like literally redeem with live, laugh, love. Oh man. Like, cause that's the thing, man. He was one of us. So like, there's like a spiritual connection, right? And he's one of us that just took like some of our black pill philosophy and it just went to create more pain and suffering and obviously pain and suffering is a bad thing because he didn't like it and you know it doesn't have to be that way and i like the guy he was one of he was a freaking poster man and you <laughs> obviously his stuff is is sympathetic have you seen his posts he would post like the you know like the the hulk hogan anime girl if you know what i'm saying yeah like, <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was totally one of us and like you know you just gotta i wish there's this one where it's like elliot roger i wish i was your mother <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah that one because some yeah. like some like uh, celebrity was like Putin, yeah. I, Putler, I wish it yeah. was your mother. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no going back and saving him because he <laughs> himself. Right. Uh, right. Dude, he shot 14 people. Like that's you know quite a bit of people. And in Santa Barbara, and I live close by too. I'm in Southern California, beaches and stuff. And so it's like, just yeah, man. It's it's one of uh, yeah. It's cr yeah. But I feel like if people hear that, they're like, oh my God, that's crazy. That's kind of like being a Columbiner. But yet there's something to it. There's something about um, the Columbiner thing that sticks into the millennial psyche. It's not, oh, that you, it's not like that you approve of like Elliot going out and like murking like 14 no. people. No, it's more of like, it's an archetypal force. It's something that yes. there's a signification there. It's like, as there are like more like public massacres that have like a higher body count for some reason, Dylan and Eric and Elliot 
they're the ones who stand I, against time in a way like yeah but what yeah. what, what do you think is the attraction there do you think it's because they exhibit the typical personality traits of being one of us or do you think it's like oh maybe <laughs> maybe that could it, be it but like i don't it, know it's sympathetic man i mean his cause is something that so many guys like relate to it's not like he was some like movie villain with some like world domination goal i mean he was an incel that was the thing dude yeah it was it, so many guys are incels and I, I bet a lot of guys feel like rage about that or whether it's whether they're suicidal and sad or sometimes instead of being suicidal and sad they get homicidal and angry you know and right. i'm sure tons of guys feel this i'm sure there's tons of guys online who feel this homicidal rage but haven't done anything he's just one of us who actually did it and it's like, oh shit, this is real. Like, this is a real thing going on. And like, that's us. Like, so many of us are just Elliot Rogers waiting to happen. And it's you know? a way, but it's not like in the typical, like, shit lib journalist, uh, like, oh my God, this radical ideology is like, ex extremists are going to radicalize young men. It's more of like, this is- He doesn't is, have an ideology. No, no, no. It's more of like a warning in some ways. What, sorry, what do you mean? Well, it's like, it, it's like to say that he chose- like you were saying, he chose the negative path to create more misery, but, yeah. but I guess he can be used as an example right? to say to the incels, like, you know, you could choose this and it would be in some ways sad and incredibly terrible, but in some ways it's a, well, not understandable. I want to say stuff that can, you know, it's sympathetic. In trouble. It's sympathetic. It's sympathetic. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But then you yeah, can absolutely. choose otherwise though. You could take the hero pill and live, laugh, right? love. Yeah. And why wouldn't you want to be a hero, man? You know, I mean, you could say that, oh, just like, I guess, why wouldn't you? You could say there's been so much hurt, but like, it's just a, it's just a choice. You know, that's what it is. It's a choice you make. It's one way or the other. And I'm advocating for the hero pill uh, for live, laugh, love. And I think it's just more fun for you. Oh, yeah. Look, if you're living, laughing and loving, you have a better time. <laughs> does the yeah. hero conquer like does the hero conquer and overcome resentment yeah. in other words absolutely and i think that yeah no go ahead go ahead i think the the hero pill the hero has a moment where he uh wants to go elliot roger and has every reason to go elliot roger every reason to go elliot roger and despite that they choose to live laugh love man yeah that's great. And like you were saying with the e-girl, the purpose of the e-girl at the beginning of this, you were saying yeah. that it serves as a sort of um, a way in which you can overcome your resentments by using what the e-girl provides to you for better. So, right. man, that's crazy. That's amazing. Yeah. I hope we de-radicalize some incels with it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, this has been amazing. We've been going for two hours, I think. Um, nice. And, and uh, wow, this has really been quite insightful. And I'm going to link all of your stuff. Uh, like, Crooner, this has been incredible. Uh, one of the best podcasts I've done. Um, and I think that you provide unique insight. And the fact that you are immersed in online culture, but yet you can lay down a narrative that, I think anyone, even a normie, can like look at your documentary and maybe find like some stuff a bit goofy or silly. Like why why are you taking internet stuff seriously? But I think that the the weight of what you are talking about is monumentally important to our time. The e girl is the entity. It is the e girl is the sort of spiritual force of the internet in a lot of ways. And uh yeah. yeah. Uh I think We're that all e -girls. we are all e-girls now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, thank you, my friend. This has been amazing. I loved uh, it. Yeah. I'm going to wait. Let me press it.